Who would you rather be governed by? The coalition or the Taliban? Come on, who is it? Is it Scott Morrison or Mullah Haibatullah Akunzada? Now, even the diehard critics of the coalition would probably run with Scott Morrison. And that's because he might be a bastard, but he's our bastard. And this is precisely at the basis of what everybody has missed in this discussion about the evacuation, about the drama going on in Kabul, in Afghanistan at the moment. Our leadership, the US leadership, the warmongers that make profits from this war, and we'll get to them in a moment, there are huge profits having been made from Australia's wars. Every one of them has been an abject, miserable failure. Vietnam, Iraq, Afghanistan, total failures. And one of the chief reasons for this is the inability for people to understand other cultures. It's the conceit, the superciliousness, that we know better than they do, that we're smarter than they are. Now, as the Taliban virtually sauntered back into Kabul 20 years after we first ejected them, clearly with the tired consent of the Afghans themselves, the blame game is now on. The war lobby has centred its blame on Joe Biden, who didn't start this war, who is trying to get America extricated from a war that they cannot win, that they never could have won, that they actually started. They even funded the Taliban when the Russians lost their long campaign in Afghanistan in the late 1970s and 1980s. So all this is descending into partisan politics and we can see it in the media, particularly the Murdoch media, that was so, that is always so keen to go to war, to go to other people's wars, wars which cannot be won because of precisely this point that we do not understand other people's cultures. And we think, or we're told at least, that this is about freedom. This is about other people embracing our culture. Now there's no mea culpa from the media and the politicians who cheered this war on. Scott Morrison said the other day, freedom is always worth fighting for when questioned about this war and whether it had been a complete failure. This denialism will continue in the media and now it's centered upon whether we left too quickly, whether we should have taken our Afghan allies out, we should evacuate them. Of course we should evacuate them. These people, their lives are at risk. They fought alongside us. We can't do enough to get them out of Afghanistan. And so it is that John Howard, the former prime minister who pushed the button for this war, has been doing the traps on his justification tour. And he is right about that one thing. We need to help these people who helped us get them over here. About the rest of it, he's wrong. He was wrong also about Iraq. In the case of Afghanistan, it was a knee-jerk reaction to the 9-11 attacks. None of the 9-11 hijackers on those planes in the US were from Afghanistan. They were mostly Saudis and Egyptians. We'd funded the Taliban against the Russians. We put them in a position to fight us. We invaded the wrong country. We didn't invade Saudi Arabia. We ended up killing the perpetrator in another country. And so as the flight from Kabul unfolds, the drama of people falling out of aeroplanes, terrible personal tragedies, the threat to women and to liberal Afghanistanis over there, allies, our allies, uh, cannot be understated. There is one reform, though, that we could make to address this problem of xenophobia, this these wars that are inspired by profiteers, by the war lobby, by people who make the weapons and advise our policymakers on how to respond militarily to things. We can do something to stop this repeating tragedy. We'll never stop our leaders kowtowing embarrassingly to the White House or to any white Western conservative foreign power, for that matter. But we can take a leaf out of their book. We can decide to make the decision to go to war a vote of parliament. Now, in both the US and the UK, this is the case. When they drag their countries off to war, there's a vote of Congress required or a vote of British Parliament. 
It's not so in Australia. It's just one man or one woman who has the power to make this decision. And that is the Prime Minister. It comes down to the decision of one person. We've called around about 60 out of the 227 members of Australia's Parliament, the Senators and the MPs in the House of Reps. We're going to keep on rolling out those responses from all the politicians so we can say, here, this is what our elected representatives believe about war reform. All this, of course, this wreckage, billions of dollars up in smoke, the climate, the damage to the climate, the trail of suicides, the high financial cost, the lives destroyed, the families left without loved ones, only to have the Taliban, the very crew we ejected 20 years ago, back in power in Afghanistan. With people now beating the drums of war about China, wanting to join if, in if there's, a, and, you know, if there's an invasion of Taiwan or whatever the crisis is. It's all inspired by the military industrial complex, of course. It's all money. We follow the money here at Michael West Media. These are the proponents, people who will make profits out of wars. And of course, people like the Murdoch press who benefit from wars. It creates copy, it creates debate, it creates excitement, it creates tragedy and disaster, which the press loves, as do their right-wing think tanks, such as Aspie, because it gives them a raison d'etre. It gives them a purpose in life, saying we have to spend more money on weapons. We're already spending absolute record amounts. It's gone like a hockey stick since the coalition government came in in 2013. Not just to the weapons manufacturers themselves, but the money also splashed around on consultants, the big four consultants consulting to foreign affairs, consulting to the, to the Department of Defence. These are the beneficiaries, these powerful vested interests. So it's no wonder they're now pushing us to arm up for a war with China. But we couldn't even beat the Taliban. The Taliban, which doesn't have one submarine, it doesn't have an air force, except perhaps the planes now, the helicopters, which the Americans have left behind as they fled. Now let's have a look at the cost of these wars financially. Iraq, $5 billion. Afghanistan, $9 billion. Vietnam, who knows? But the losses in human terms are incalculable. Iraq, of course, was the supreme folly, which not only backfired in military terms, but it led to the creation of ISIS and a wave of terrorism on a global scale. In one sense, the invasion of Afghanistan is more understandable than the other wars because it was a knee-jerk reaction. Someone's ass had to be kicked for the 9-11 attacks. Even though it was patently obvious, any historian could have told you, the British had been unable to control Afghanistan. The Russians, who were next door, the Soviet Union in those days, had been unable to control Afghanistan. They left as we armed the Taliban, as the Americans armed the Taliban, they left with their tail between their legs. Here we are, 20 years later, the cost of these wars, these failed wars have been immense because we decided to march off blithely to the US. So who are the winners? It's very clear, it's very easy to see. All you have to do is go to the share market and look at the share prices of the likes of Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman, Halliburton, you know, a dozen or so large multinational weapons manufacturers. They have made dazzling profits out of all these wars and they will continue to push for more profits to be made out of future wars. If you check out our revolving doors section on the website, Michelle Fay, the absolutely excellent defence correspondent, has listed dozens of Australian military chiefs, politicians and bureaucrats, Army, Air Force, Navy, the creme de la creme, who serve, who do their public service and then jump ship over to the private sector to represent on much higher money, military defence contractors. The revolving doors are absolutely key to this. These are the people that push for wars on behalf of their companies that make the profits from the wars. And so it is that the defence budget for Australia continues to balloon with strike jets that don't work, with submarine programs that will come into commission decades after they're needed, if there was a war right now where we needed them. We have lost control 
of defence. Defence has fused with the private sector, with foreign multinational interests. We even have a defence industry minister, not just a defence minister, defence industry minister, to promote the profiteering effectively from wars under the guise of self-defence. None of these wars that we've been involved in were self-defence. They're invading other people's territories, territories, peoples that didn't want us there. As for Afghanistan, this war-ravaged nation now has little chance of freedom, but it never really did anyway. Perhaps now, though, the Taliban, perhaps one day they might be able to become 65th in the world in broadband like Australia. They might be able to make the highest subsidies in the world for large corporations like Australia, export their weapons to the Middle East and hotspots like Saudi Arabia, Yemen. Maybe they can introduce franking credits. They may be able to rival us in the end as a sovereign nation. This is an absolute failure, whichever way you look at it. So what is the answer? The answer is not to get involved in useless foreign wars. Like this video, if you'd like to see reform to war powers, to protect Australians and future generations from being dragged off to useless wars that cause more destruction than peace.